everybody, welcome to Leaf by Leaf. Uh, today I'm really excited about this video because I'm going to talk about one of my favorite authors. Not that I haven't done that in uh, all the videos I've posted so far. Uh, but this is an extraordinary uh, writer who's been writing since uh, the late 80s uh, and whose output is extremely prolific. Um, in fact, uh, as we'll hear in a moment from an article in the New York uh, Times uh, back in the 90s, we'll find that he, at one point he needed five different American publishers just to keep up with his output uh, in a given year. His name is William T. Volman. And hopefully uh, by the end of this video, if you aren't already a fan and aren't already reading his work, uh, you'll rush out and start to get copies. So this is an appreciation um, and also a case for reading William T. Volman. This is my collection of Volman's output. It is but a fraction. Um, on the left, it includes a reader um, that came out, um, and then Poor People, which is his immersive journalism, uh, Imperial, which you see um, on top of Imperial is his debut novel, um, which is very Pinchon-esque, You Bright and Risen Angels. Um, underneath Imperial is his latest work of nonfiction, at least in book form. Um, he is a prolific journalist. He, he, I think, I believe his most recent work was an article um, called Just Keep Going North uh, for Harper's Magazine, uh, where he spent some time down at the border wall in Arizona. Uh, and then Europe Central, which is standing there, uh, to the right and uh, perpendicular to my writing table. That finally landed him a National Book Award. And then finally, uh, for fans of Volman, uh, this is probably uh, one of his greatest book, uh, greatest uh, pro writing projects, the Seven Dreams series, uh, beginning with the Ice Shirt and then carrying on through Fathers and Crows, Argal, the Rifles, and then the dying grass. As you can see, these are all hefty, hefty tomes. Oh, I just remembered. Uh, he has another book. Rising Up and Rising Down. Some Thoughts on Violence, Freedom, and Urgent Means. Um, unfortunately, for those who know about this work, uh, it is a multi-volume series. Right now, I can't find it uh, used on the internet for any less than a thousand dollars. So I got the abridged version uh, that he worked with the Echo publisher um, to condense down. It's still a hefty tone, but uh, this is his attempt to come up with a moral calculus for when it is and is not okay to use violence. Uh, if you need any convincing that William T. Volman is perhaps one of the most well-read, if not the most well-read person, um, besides maybe Michael Derda uh, in America, than just a perusal of the bibliography of this that he has referred to as his life's work will convince you. So let's talk for a moment about Fathers and Crows. Uh, of the Seven Dreams series, this uh, roughly 900-page uh, well, about a thousand if you count the sources book um, about the clash of the Iroquois and Huron peoples in Canada and Quebec, uh, then spelled with a K, um, and the black gowns from France uh, that were sent over to attempt to convert them all, um, is often cited by William T. Volman fans as the as his if not his greatest book, then definitely uh, the best of the Seven Dreams series. Uh, and in fact, um, there, this, this is a, a good example of his immersive uh, style of research. Uh, first of all, he, um, when he was, um, Research, when he was in, I believe it was Times Square, um, he was just walking around convincing uh, people from the seedy underbelly of the city 
uh, to let him hang out with them so that he could get a sense of what life is like for them. And he ended up getting held down uh, and burned all over his body, well, all over his arms by cigarettes. And that features uh, in this book, Fathers and Crows. Um, so it's just a, well, I'm losing focus here. Sorry about that. Um, so that features uh, in his work all throughout. Uh, he attempts to go and really understand these uh, people and situations, and especially the climate. He has uh, talked, come on now, get in focus. He has uh, talked about how he's very interested in how geography plays into culture and into people. Uh, the Rifles, which is the smallest volume of the series, um, the Rifles, let me see if I can change this focus. There we go. The Rifles, uh, as Madison Smart Bell uh, wrote in her, her article uh, for, uh, I believe it was the New York Times, or maybe, uh, I don't know. But anyway, it was an article from 1994, uh, and she talked about how research for this book, where people are trying to find uh, the Northwest Passage, and they end up in uh, extreme colds, uh, cold. Um, he said that uh, he flew uh, to this area <clears throat> and lived there by himself uh, for a while uh, with no one around because he really wanted to, to, to know what it was like for them before he wrote this book. Um, and as Madison Smart Bell writes, extremes of cold overwhelmed Volman's gear, plastic shattered, the fringe of fur around his face froze to the consistency of a wire brush, and worst of all, his sleeping bag failed to warm him. In fact, he set his sleeping bag on fire, trying to dry, trying to dry it. Um, soon he was hallucinating from lack of sleep. Uh, so this guy, he really gives himself over to his work. Uh, in fact, uh, Madison Smart Bell also writes that he works 16 hour days on the computer. He came down with a case of repetitive motion disorder that has not lit up since. Uh, and because of carpal tunnel syndrome, he has to restrict his hours on the computer and he writes more often in a notebook now. His first book, which is uh, largely uh, a fantastic allegory, and it is packed wall to wall with text. As you can see, uh, it's a very um, daring and courageous debut novel um, where the, you can see there's very, very little dialogue. Um, there is an insane table of contents, uh, a cast of characters in the beginning, um, and he even makes up his own sort of language um, and has one of the greatest sign-offs um, for, as an author's note that I've ever read in a book. This is a, an incredible work of maximalism um, in, the, in the vein of Gravity's Rainbow. However, uh, when we read in the um, reader from Larry McCaffrey and uh, Michael Hemmingson, <clears throat> uh, he Volman said he does not see the connection between Gravity's Rainbow and You Brighten Risen Angels. Uh, and in fact, he didn't even read uh, Thomas Pynchon's uh, Gravity's Rainbow until after he had written this book. However, the link uh, that I see and that I think others see, um, as well as many books, all, you know, through Infinite Jest and so on, is that Gravity's Rainbow sort of signaled the okay to write books, exhaustive books like that. Um, interestingly, even though for me, this is a very complex work uh, that took a lot of thought and an extreme amount of knowledge, um, he himself said of the book that he dismisses it now as a kid's book. Um, it was too easy to go on and on and on and have a good time making things up. So th that his first novel um, is so striking and 
so packed and then for him to look at it and say, oh, it was just easy to dash off shows uh, some of the extreme knowledge that he has. For me, Carbon Ideologies is where he really uh, is picking up the pace and starting to make a splash. Um, these came out a couple years back or maybe last year. Um, I read these and the first one sort of, uh, it takes on coal um, and just it has tons of I, I don't even know how to how to start with this thing but it combines so many things uh, Volman taps into his vast resources of specialists um, from mathematicians to ecologists and uh, you name it to put these charts together um, to show uh, different things around the world that have to do with uh, carbon ideologies. It's got his sardonic wit that permeates everything he's written. Um, and he go, he travels all over the world um, and, and harnesses that immersive journalism um, that is his trademark uh, to bring us um, a, a real bird's eye, well not bird's eye, but a real uh, human eye view of what's going on. Um, I was so inspired by this book that I actually called up my local water treatment plant and arranged uh, a tour of the facility where I sort of played out my own version of Volman uh, with my camera and a notepad. Um, and I will tell you, they were very taken aback and very hesitant, but the, uh, the chair of the board of trustees ended up coming uh, and letting me into the plant and taking me around for four hours. And I have to say, uh, I can see why um, Volman uh, continues to do this stuff because it is uh, eye-opening and brings you face-to-face uh, -face with a lot of things that you otherwise wouldn't know. Um, then the second volume takes on uh, nuclear, um, and fracking, uh, gas, natural gas, oil, and so on. Uh, together, uh, these books are uh, some of the, the, greatest, um, the greatest books you can read uh, on everything that's going on with uh, climate, global warming, um, natural resources, sustainable resources. Um, he does not flinch away for, from anything. Uh, and this also shows how objective Volman can be. He is not aligned with any political party. He is not a, um, you know, a, a lobbyist in any way. He is just a guy who is obsessed um, with seeking out truth and giving us a raw image of what's going on. If you've hung with me so far, I hope that I've convinced you um, at least a little bit about why you should read um, and pay attention to William T. Volman. To wrap up the video, I'd just like to read a couple of things from the reader called Expelled from Eden. Um, the first one is uh, from an interview with uh, Larry McCaffrey where he asked Volman uh, about his favorite contemporary or his most admired contemporary books. And though he, you know, he lists things, he says Hawthorne may be the best, which is interesting. Uh, then Faulkner, he's got Hemingway, he says, is usually a wonderful read. Uh, he's got uh, Siegfried, Unset's trilogy, Kristen, Lavren Statter. Um, my Scandinavian accent isn't that great. Uh, he's got um, bits of Proust and Zola in here, Poe's stories about love, Nabokov, Melville's Pierre. Uh, even Philip K. Dix is Scanner Darkly. But then he says this, or let me uh, quote what Larry McCaffrey is writing. Bill, William T. Volman, concluded by saying there's lots more, adding that he was sorry not to be able to put down less contemporary things, such as the tale of Gingy, which is one of my all-time favorites, quoted from William T. Volman. So it makes sense that something like the tale of Gingy, a big fat book, um, that takes place, uh, you know, in a different century in the past in, in Japan. Uh, it just has Volman all over it. Uh, the second thing that I think is great is his letter against cuts. Uh, this had to do with Fathers and Crows, which we talked about a moment ago, but he sent this uh, to his editors and gave this four, four or five page uh, statement on why they shouldn't make him cut down his manuscript, which was 1,400 pages, down to 1,000. 
and it, it's amazing. He's he's with the the confidence. He says, uh, and then he's so bold as to say, if the ice shirt didn't make you money, Fathers and Crows isn't likely to make you money either. Um, but the Seven Dreams is not like Stephen King and never will be. And then he says, I honestly believe that Fathers and Crows is my best work so far and that it will eventually be recognized as such. I think that that is a bold statement uh, to predict that. And a lot of people are now recognizing um, now that he's in there doing a lot more nonfiction um, and coming to the forefront of very serious issues such as immigration, the border uh, controversies that are going on, and then global warming and climate change and so on, he's starting to get recognized. Uh, not to also mention again his National Book Award for Europe Central. Uh, but now people are going back and, and saying, uh, wow, Fathers and, and Crows is this uh, amazingly well-researched book. Uh, the last thing I'd like to leave you with that may convince you um, is that he gives a list of social changes that would assist the flourishing of literary beauty. Um, it's extracted from his essay, Something to Die For, which appeared in the Review uh, of Contemporary Fiction. Number one, abolish television because it has no reverence for time. Number two, abolish the automobile because it has no reverence for space. Number three, make citizenship contingent upon literacy in every sense. Thus, politicians who do not write every word of their own speeches should be thrown out of office in disgrace. Writers who require editors to make their books good should be depublished. And finally, number four, teach reverence for all beauty, including that of the word. So that concludes uh, my case for William T. Volman. I hope that you're at least somewhat convinced and you'll go out and start reading him uh, and and getting him out there for more people to enjoy. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe. I plan to do at least weekly videos and uh, chiefly about, of course, my own uh, preferences for literature, my favorite authors, my favorite books, but hopefully some themed videos coming up and hopefully my rambling will cut down eventually. Thank you all and have a great day.